Well, hey there, this is Pastor Scott Gould, and I'm so thankful that you've decided to join us here to worship the living God. And our online worship services are available to you to help and to encourage you, to lead you in worshiping God Almighty in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. And we're thankful that you have decided to be a part of this worship time. And we just want to encourage you that this online resource, this online worship service should in no way uh, replace or inhibit you or anyone else from being a part of Christian fellowship with other believers. And so we would want to encourage each of us to be a part of a Christian Bible study, a Christian small group, and then continue to gather together with other believers face to face. So if we can be of help to you in any way, please call the church office. Please let us know. Let me know how you would desire to be a part of Christian fellowship with other believers uh, face to face. And so may God bless you. And would you just be willing right now to open your heart to the living God and let's worship together. I want to invite you to stand to your feet as we worship the Lord together. We are going to be singing the song, Surely the Presence, and that's in your red hymnal number 219. Let's worship together. Amen, and you may be seated. And that song is our prayer today, that God would be in this place, that His presence would be right here, because guess what? You're here. And if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible calls you a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that Christ is in you, and that is the hope of glory. Amen? Amen. And so we see glory on each face. It's good to see you all this morning. Uh, we at St. Paul's are a people who believe that God's word is at the center and Jesus Christ is Lord. And we're thankful that you're here worshiping with us this morning. Just have a few announcements that I want to bring to our attention. First announcement is not last week, but the week prior. Uh, many of us went to uh, family and youth Bible camp in Cedar Lake, Indiana. So we have a bunch of pictures here. There were like 250 people at camp. So uh, God did a cool thing there, bringing all these people out. There was over a hundred students, and uh, uh, if you can find if you can find yourself or someone you know in here, great job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but this is the big group picture that we took on Wednesday, and it was just a lot of people. And it's cool. The cool thing I think about family camp is that we all get to be together. We do everything kind of together. We eat together. We go to classes. Uh, each age group goes to class together. Um, it's just cool to just see people out and about and around um, during the time. So as I mentioned, there was good teaching. There was adult sessions all the way down to preschool age sessions, and there was a nursery. Um, so that's really exciting. And then just the kids have a lot of free time just to have fun. The facilities are really good. They have kind of an indoor billiards room. They have a beach. They have hatchet throwing. Anyone ever been hatchet throwing before? Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. They have little metal axes. Um, they have uh, swimming and canoeing. Um, there's Gavin right there being silly. He wore that cape all week. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how he didn't trip and fall over it because it was really long. We had a great time of praise and worship. Um, just a good time. Uh, let's see. Let's uh, get some of these pictures up here. Yeah, there's Maria up there praising and worshiping. And then Pastor Tim Badal from Village Bible Church. He was kind of the keynote speaker in the evening, so we got to enjoy his preaching. And it was just a really great time. So, 
As a church body, we want to just thank you for your support for Family and Youth Bible Camp. It's such a great thing for our kids and our youth and our adults to be a part of. And so thank you for your support on that and just wanted to give you an update on that. Um, and uh, this year at Bible Camp, uh, I just really had, me personally, um, just had a really good time. There was just good, quiet times with the Lord. And that's one thing that Bible Camp really encourages as well, is just giving you the time to worship, giving you the time to pray and read and praise God. And so that's what it's all about. So thank you again for your support on that. Um, and so another announcement I have today is that it's not in your bulletin, but uh, one thing that I do want to bring to your attention is that uh, our church council... Uh, has put together uh, a church-wide survey that we are going to be sending out. And so uh, the plan is that we are going to be sending that out through email and through regular mail. So uh, check your mailbox, check your inbox on your email. Um, if you don't receive emails from our church and you'd like to, let us know so that we can get your email and we can send that survey out to you. But really the goal of that, that church-wide survey is, is relationship. Um, uh, as you turn in that feedback on the certain questions that we have, uh, we want that to be kind of a two-way dialogue. We want that to be something that uh, we want to hear from our congregation. Preferences, opinions, just what would be most helpful to you in various areas. We have several categories, small groups, worship service, uh, just general fellowship things. And we just want to hear your input on that. So I just want to encourage you, be on the lookout for that. Hopefully this week they'll come in your mailbox, uh, and hopefully this week they'll come in your inbox. If you have any questions about that, talk to Nicholas. He's back there. I'm just kidding. Talk to me. Uh, or, I mean, you can talk to Nicholas. That's fine. He's kind of nice. But, um, but if you have questions about that, just, just let me know. Uh, and the goal is, as we're a church that's moving from a time uh, before COVID, through COVID, hope by God's grace, post-COVID, uh, we just kind of want to hear feedback. We just kind of want to hear what is on your heart. And so we'd encourage you, it's 20 questions, not long ones. A lot of them are check boxes. So we just want to encourage you, fill that out, get that back to us. And uh, our goal is to have those, as we send those out two weeks from that date, we'd like them back. That way we can compile the information. We'll still take them after that, but that's kind of our goal. So be on the lookout for that. We want to hear from you. If you have any questions, let me know. All right? Sound good? Good. All right. And uh, if you look on the back of your bulletin, a couple other announcements just want to, just want to highlight. Um, on August 21st, there, we're having a Gospel Music Sunday. So if you would like to participate in that, uh, please contact Christina Jepson. Uh, there's a small group leader brunch next Sunday after church in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, many of you have came to that. If you've missed the ones before, come to this one if you have interest in that. And then Rally Sunday is September 11th, about a month away, coming right up. So God's doing a lot here. I'd like to ask, let's pray together. Let's seek the Lord as we worship, continue to worship him today. Father, thank you for all that you do. Lord, thank you for all that you are. You are so kind. You're so good to us. You're a gentle father. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to follow you. You would help us to worship you this morning in spirit and and in truth, give us energy. Give us passion in our hearts for you. Give us a desire to sing to you, to pray to you. God, as we hear your word, help us be doers of your word. And help us believe in the good news of Jesus. And let that be a comfort to us as we trust in him. God, help us today. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd invite you to stand together as we confess our sins as it's printed in your bulletin. Let's confess together. Almighty and everlasting God, we bow before you in repentance for our sins. We have sinned against you in many ways, most of which are unknown even to us. Forgive us for bad attitudes that offend you, for remarks that hurt you and others, for not following your word and spirit as they try to lead us. 
Forgive us for those times when we have forgotten to call upon you and help us to live our lives in the way that will please you. This we pray, thanking you for your great love for us. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And let's continue to sing together, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. The first scripture reading is from 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 6 through 11. First Kings 12, beginning with verse 6. King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who had served his father Solomon while he was still alive, saying, How do you console me to answer this people? Then they spoke to him, saying, If you will be a servant to this people today, and will serve them and grant them their petition, and speak good news, good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the elders which they had given him, and consulted with the young men who grew up with him and served him. So he said to them, What counsel do you give that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Lighten the yoke which your father put on us. The young men who grew up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you shall say to this people who spoke to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now you make it lighter for us. But you shall speak to them, My little finger is thicker than my father's lions. Whereas my father loaded you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with, disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. The second scripture reading is from Psalm 100. Psalm 100, starting with verse 1.
Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. May God bless the reading of his word. Before we go to the Lord in prayer, I did want to mention um, a couple weeks ago, Chris and Hope were up uh, sharing what it was like to be carrying twins. And yesterday afternoon, uh, they had two healthy little ba six-pound baby girls, uh, Adeline and Evelyn, and sounds like everyone's doing well. Uh, so congratulations to the Frost and Hofschneider family, just an awesome blessing yesterday. So as we go to the Lord in prayer, we'll be thanking him for the girls. So let's just pray together. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you and praise you and give you our worship today. Uh, Lord, what, what an awesome feeling to be in your presence. And heavenly Father, we thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. Lord, we do pray in thanksgiving for uh, the birth of Adeline and Evelyn, and, and Lord, we just rejoice along with the Hofschneider and Frost family this morning that everything uh, went well and that the girls are healthy and that that hope is healthy and that, uh, Lord, you're just so good, so good and so faithful. Lord, this morning we do lift up those who have physical needs, those that need healing, those that need your healing touch from our families, from our church, from our community, amongst our friends. And Lord, at this time, all of us have someone who cries out to you for healing today. And Lord, we just lift them up right now in the quietness of our own heart. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge as we name the people on our prayer list who need healing, Lord, we acknowledge that you know everything about them. Lord, you know the number of hairs on their head and you know what's going on in their bodies. And so, Lord, we pray that you would minister to them physically, that if it would be your will, you would give them in the healing in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we also pray that you would minister to each person that we pray for, minister to their hearts and souls. Give them comfort and peace. Give strength to their families as they love and encourage uh, their family members that, that have been praying for a healing. And so, Lord, this morning we do specifically lift up Don, Jackie, Kevin, Earl, Armin and Shar, Matthew, Candy, Eldon, Lisa, Debbie, Lorene, Mary, Ernie, Lord, we lift up those in our families that need healing. We lift this specifically this morning. Thomas, Richard, and Phyllis, Bridget, Ryan, Graydon, Kara, and Dean. We lift up our friends and community members, Jennifer and Nora, Linda, and Angie. Lord, we know that you have a good and perfect plan for each one of them. Lord, give them your comfort. Give them your peace that passes all understanding. Lord, allow them to feel your supernatural presence as as they walk through life right now. Heavenly Father, we do lift up our service men and women, particularly those from our church and our community. We ask that you guard and protect them. Lord, that you would guide them in their decisions. And above all, Lord, that you would make them more like you each and every day. Lord, we do pray for our government. We pray for uh, elections and primaries and the things going on in our country. Lord, we pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we pray for our leaders, that you would give them godly conviction and godly courage to stand upon your word and make decisions according to what honors and glorifies their God. Heavenly Father, we pray for the persecuted church this morning. This morning, we pray specifically for the church in India. Lord, we pray for those that, that boldly proclaim the gospel in places where it's, it's dangerous, Lord, where they risk imprisonment where they risk losing everything to proclaim the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray that your name would be spread throughout the world, that you would bless those who step out in faith in these persecuted nations to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, specifically this morning, we pray for Open Doors Ministry and Voice of the Martyrs, both which minister to those who are persecuted for their faith. 
Lord, we ask that you would lift up those who are in countries where the name of Jesus Christ is, is forbidden to teach and preach. And so, Lord, we just ask that you be with those uh, in, in those countries and those ministries that minister to missionaries, that you would be with them this morning. Lord, we pray for our local churches. We pray specifically this morning for the Potomac Church of the Nazarene and Pastor Randy Holden and their congregation. Uh, Lord, we do lift up the congregation at Schwer as they begin the call process and look for a pastor. This morning, Lord, we lift up Pastor Scott and Chrissy as they traveled out to Colorado for a family funeral. Just minister to them in their grief and give their family comfort and peace. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you be with us as a church. Help us to be a light in this community. Help us to shine brightly for Jesus in the things that we do, the things that we say, even the interactions that we have with people in our community, that we would display the love and kindness of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you for the opportunity to cry out to you in prayer, to talk to you in prayer, to talk to you as one talks to a friend, your word says. And Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the opportunity just for you to hear and answer the cries of your people. This morning, Lord, we, we pray together in unity the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Would you please stand for the singing of our next hymn?
Before I begin, will you pray with me? Lord God, I just pray that you would allow your word to speak to us, give your Holy Spirit to us to hear and discern what your word would tell us today. And then, Lord, equip us with your spirit to give us courage and boldness and strength to go out and live out your world, to live out your word in a world that, that does not want to hear it. Heavenly Father, we ask that you just allow us to block out distractions of the day. Lord, there's just so many things that fill our lives, that fill our, our days and our weeks. But Lord, allow us to just take these moments to focus upon you, to focus upon your word, and to focus upon Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning, um, we're still in our sermon series with uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this morning, the title for the message is Following Father's Advice. And so this morning, I, I just wanted to share, I you know, just hit Google to look for uh, advice for each one of us. And most of these are, are humorous and take them for what they're worth. I, a lot of them I hadn't heard before. Um, so here's some advice uh, when I just Googled uh, good, friendly advice. These are some of the things that came up. If you do something bad, make sure there's someone around to take the blame for you. It's not bad. Uh, only chickens accomplish something by just sitting around on their butts. Uh, if you can't find your kids in the house, turn off the Wi-Fi. They will magically appear. Uh, silence is golden unless you have children, and then silence is suspicious. Uh, if you never want to forget your wife's birthday, just forget it one time. That's probably true. If you think the other side of the fence is greener, chances are there's just more manure over there. And this one I want to add with a caution as I tell young men this one. Smart girls want to hear how pretty they are, and pretty girls want to hear how smart they are. Young men, use that one with caution. Um, so we, get, we hear a lot of advice in this world, right? And today we're talking about heeding the father's advice, where Jacob has the choice of following the advice of his earthly father, as well as following the, the advice of his heavenly father. And when he does that, we're going to see in the next few weeks, following the father's advice changes his entire life. And so for us as believers, as we hear the word today, as we hear uh, advice, commands from the Father, you know, we can take confidence in knowing that this is life-changing advice. So this morning, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 28, uh, gen pretty much the whole chapter, Genesis 28. But as you turn there, I want to kind of set up a couple things. There are some things that have happened between when we last heard about Jacob and Esau to now. Last week, we heard about uh, Jacob stealing the birthright of his brother. And so this week, uh, we, we did not hear, this week we're going to talk about Jacob finding a wife. But what we're not going to hear about, what has happened in the meantime, uh, is Jacob has also stolen his brother's blessing. And for many of us, that's the story about Jacob and Esau that we remember, uh, where Jacob, with the help of his mother, puts the goat skin on his arms and his mom cooks Isaac his favorite meal, and he deceives Isaac into giving him the blessing. We, we've heard that story many, many times in Sunday school. Jacob steals the blessing of his brother. The other thing that has happened between what we read last week and what we're going to read this week is Esau has married two women, uh, Hittite women, two women that are not from Israel, that worship false gods, and that has also been thrown into the mix here as we set up chapter 28 in Genesis, where uh, Jacob is going to be told to go look for a wife. So those two things have happened in between. So as we look at Scripture, look back with me here at Genesis chapter 27, verse 46, just one verse before 28. And that's where we're going to pick up this morning. Genesis 27, 46, and we're going to go through 28, 5. Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I loathe my wife because of the Hittite women. Talking about Esau's wives. If Jacob marries one of these Hittite women, one of the women of that land, what good will my life be? Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and directed him and said, you must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. Arise and go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, 
your mother's father, and take as your wife from there one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply, that you may become a company of peoples. May he give the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you, that you may take possession of the land of your sojournings that God has given to Abraham. Thus Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Padan and Aram, to, to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob and Esau's mother. And so the first thing that Jacob does is he listens to godly counsel. Your first point in, the, in your notes this morning is listen to godly counsel. And I do want to point out, parents, uh, this is right after uh, Jacob and Rebekah have deceived Isaac. And we see here in chapter 28, the first thing that Isaac does is he blesses his son. And this blessing doesn't come by trickery or fooling him or anything like that. This is a blessing that comes from Isaac's heart. This is the love of his earthly father. And parents, we can kind of be tempted sometimes to remind our kids of their mistakes. And we can learn from this example here of Isaac where he just wants to bless his son. And this blessing doesn't come with conditions. It doesn't come with a reminder of, you know, my son who just fooled me, here's your blessing. No, it's a blessing from the father's heart where he, he wants to bless his son and show that love to him. And, but this blessing comes with instruction. And that instruction is that Jacob is to go to Padan Aram, which is 500 miles from where they live. And there are biblical scholars that say this instruction was also a form of discipline from Isaac, where yes, he was fooled by his son, and yes, he's going to go by his word and give him the blessing and acknowledge his birthright that he's taken from his older brother, but he's going to make this 500-mile journey alone by himself to go find his wife. And so Jacob is sent out to travel 500 miles to find his wife. And young men and young women, that would be like asking you to walk to Minneapolis to find your wife from Gifford, where your parents would say, your wife is in the land of my people, the land of lakes in Minnesota, get to walking 500 miles from here. And so that's the journey that Jacob is going to take. He's going to travel 500 miles to Rebecca's family, to her people, to find a wife. And so that's not easy advice to, to heed, but Jacob listens to this godly counsel. He listens to his father. And, and sometimes, you know, we don't want to hear that kind of advice, the advice that's hard to hear. And, and we heard that in 1 Kings 12. Logan read that passage in Scripture uh, where Rehoboam, he brings the elders who served under Solomon, and he says, what should I do with these people? And they say, well, you should actually speak kind words to them, and once you do, they'll follow you forever. And he doesn't like that advice. So it says, he goes and gets the people that he grew up with. And he surrounds himself with the people that he grew up with. And then he says, what should I do with these people? And they tell him what he wants to hear. And so that's the advice he goes with. And it ends up backfiring. He ends up uh, putting a heavy burden on the Israelite people and they end up rebelling against him. And so a lot of times in our lives, we can end up asking the people where we know what they are going to say. We ask people who are going to tell us what we want to hear. Uh, I just got a new phone recently. I have over 2,500 contacts in my phone. There's plenty of people to choose from if I want to talk to someone who's going to tell me what I want to hear. You know, a few years ago, we were scheduled to go on a mission trip to Pennsylvania. And right before we were supposed to go, three, four days before, I was having chest pains and had to go to the emergency room. And so uh, they, they did tests on me, and, and the doctor said, you know, we don't think you had a heart attack or anything major, but we want to monitor this and we don't want you to go anywhere. And I said, well, what, I have a mission trip in like three days that I, that I want to go on. He said, you, I don't want you to go on this trip. And so I asked my wife what she thought. And she said, are you crazy? The doctor just said, you're not going on this trip. You shouldn't go on this trip. And I asked my parents, what do you think? And they said, are you kidding? Your doctor said, don't go. You shouldn't go. And so I called my youth group kids and I said, you know what? I think I'll be fine. Should I go? And they're like, yeah, why not? You should go. And so I talked to someone from our church who was actually on our church council at the time and asked them what they thought. And they said, your, wife, your doctor says you shouldn't go. Your wife says you shouldn't go. Your parents say you shouldn't go. Our pastor says you shouldn't go. They said, 
If God asked you or told you, you could hear the audible voice of God saying, Gary, go on this trip. Would you go on this trip? I say, yeah, of course I would. Well, if you heard the audible voice of God saying, don't go on this trip, would you go on this trip? I said, no, of course not. He said, well, God has put these people in your life to give you advice, to give you wisdom, and time after time after time, they've said no. So God is telling you no. Only you've wanted to surround yourself with people that will tell you yes. And so that's what we do sometimes. We, we surround ourselves with the people that tell us what we want to hear, that tell us the direction that we would like to go in our hearts. So this morning, I just have a couple quick, easy questions for us to think about. Number one is, who do you seek godly counsel from? Who do you seek godly counsel from? Who, who is willing to give you godly wisdom even when it's something you don't want to hear? Who's going to give you wisdom not from their gut, not from their experience, but from God's word and from answered prayer. And the second question I want us to ask ourselves is, when we talk about godly counsel, are you someone that people turn to for godly counsel? And if you're not, what do we have to do to become those people? You know, I, I think a lot of it is we want, to tell, we want to please people and tell people what they want to hear. And sometimes God's word isn't what people want to hear. If we want to be people that are considered godly counsel, we need to be in God's word and telling truth to people even when it's hard for them to hear. We need to be people of prayer where if someone comes to us for counsel and we don't know the answer, we say, I don't know, but I will go to the Lord in prayer for you. And they know that we mean it when we say, I will go to the Lord in prayer for you. That's what it takes to become someone who is considered godly counsel. And so Jacob is now confronted with this godly counsel. And so he obeys. He, he goes ahead and he, he leaves uh, for a 500 miles away to go find his wife. And in the meantime, in the midst of this story, it's three little verses about his brother Esau. And our second point is about Esau. Point number two in your notes, let go of your sin. Let go of your sin. Look with me at Genesis chapter 28, beginning at the sixth verse. It says, now Esau saw that Esau saw. Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padam Aram to take his wife from there, and that he was blessed when he directed him. You must not take a wife from Canaanite women. And that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padam Aram. And when Esau saw that Canaanite women did not please Isaac his father, Esau went to Ishmael and took as his wife, besides the wives that he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Naboth. Okay, so Esau sees that mom and dad want Jacob to marry an Israelite woman and that it made him happy. And so Esau thinks, well, then if it pleased him that Jacob's going to marry one of mom's relatives, I'll marry one of dad's relatives and I'll make him happy. And so he goes off and he finds a wife. Now, the problem with that is we just talked about in chapter 26, it says Esau already has two wives. He already has two Canaanite wives, but he thinks marrying this third is going to please his parents. He wants to try to do this right to make up for two wrongs. And a lot of times in our lives, like we do that with each other, right? Uh, this is a while back, quite a while back. I was at Walmart buying flowers and the cashier jokingly said to me, what did you do wrong, right? Like as men, sometimes we buy our wives flowers and uh, people think that it's to make up for something that we've done. And so that's what Esau's mindset is here. I know I did this wrong. I know I did this wrong. But if I do this right, then they'll be pleased with me. And we can do that with God as well, where, yes, I have this sin that I won't give up and I have this sin that I won't give up. But, but Lord, I did this for you. And God says through his word time and time again, repent and stop doing the things that you're doing and turn to me. You know, Esau wants to take the easy way out, although I can't imagine a third wife would be easy. But he thinks taking a third wife is going to fix his problems, that that is going to make his parents approve of him. And, and we can do that with people. We can do that with the Lord rather than 
give up the things that we've been doing wrong, the things that, we, that are sinful in our lives, we think, well, what if I just did this instead and try to take that easy way out? You know, as I've gotten older and I look at scripture, I try to ask myself, why did God put that in there? You know, we see in, in Genesis, this is the story of Jacob. You know, we see from his birth what Jacob is like. We talked about him taking his brother's birthright. Uh, you, you read about him stealing his, his brother's blessing. You read about Jacob's ladder. You read about Jacob wrestling with God. You read about Jacob and Laban and Jacob and Leah and Jacob and Rebekah. This is the story of Jacob. But here in the middle of chapter 28, for three verses, God mentions this passage about Esau taking a third wife because he thought it would please his mom and dad. And as I read this passage, it just struck me. You know, this is written over 2,000 years ago, and God gives me a warning, gives you a warning about pleasing people instead of pleasing God. You know, we live in a society of people pleasers, and I am a self-confessed people pleaser. Like, I want people to be happy with me, and I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make sure they're happy. And I think a lot of us are that way. And this passage that this family is a family of people pleasers. You know, it says as soon as they're born that, that Isaac loved Esau and Rebekah loved Jacob. And that's how they grew up. They grew up pleasing their sons and having their sons please them. And then Rebekah wants to please her son Jacob, so they trick Isaac. And Esau wants to please his dad, so he's off hunting, trying to kill the best game for the best food for his dad. And they're all people pleasers in this family. And by the end, you see the problem with people pleasing because this family is a mess. Uh, in, ver in chapter 27, we read, Rebecca says, I hate my life. I hate my life. And, and Isaac has been fooled by his son twice now. And Esau literally wants to kill his brother. Part of the reason Jacob is on a 500-mile journey is because his mom says, get away from your brother because he wants to kill you. So this family is in turmoil because they're all trying to please each other, please people, instead of pleasing God. And so we can do that in our lives, where we try to please our friends. We try to please our neighbors. We try to please our boss or our coworkers. We try to please our family, especially our kids, where as parents, uh, our we want to make sure our kids are put first. I went to a, a youth conference years ago, and, and they said one of the major differences in parenting these days versus the old days, he says, parents, when parents have to complete this sentence, I want my kids to be blank. Par parents of my generation and younger uh, will typically say, I want my kids to be happy. I want my kids to be happy. And we think of that and we're like, well, yeah, that makes sense. We don't want them to be miserable. You know, of course we want to make our kids happy. The generation before us and the generation before us typically would have answered that question, I want my children to be good people. I want my children to be good people. As Christians, we should answer that question as, I want my children to be like Jesus. You know, and I don't just want to put it as parenting. Let's look at that from our own perspective in our own lives. If you say about yourself, and I say about myself, I just want to be, a lot of us would say happy. I just want to be happy. As Christians, we should be wanting to say, I just want to be like Jesus. I just want to be more like Jesus. And that doesn't always mean that it's going to make me happy. I just want to be more like Jesus. I don't want to please people. I want to please him. You know, we can ask ourselves a really simple question this morning. Who am I living to please today? Am I living a life that is pleasing to God? Are my words, my actions, my thoughts, my interactions with people, are they meant to please other people and what they think of me? Or are they meant to please God? You know, we have these short little three verses in Genesis, and we can think, you know what, that's just some throwaway verses. Let's get back to the story of Jacob. But I really do think that God wants to caution us about where our priorities are. He wants to caution us, live a life pleasing to me 
You don't have to try to please people all the time. So that's what we see in Esau's life. We see that come to fruition in this family's life. And and we're going to see it here, just in this passage, where Jacob's life starts to change when he just wants to please God. So, So let's move on. Let's go to our third point here this morning. We want to live in the presence of God. Live in the presence of God. Look with me at chapter 28, beginning at the 10th verse. Jacob left Beersheba and he went towards Haran and he came to a certain place and stayed there at night because the sun had set. And taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and laid down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth and the top reached the heavens. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac, the land on which you now lie, I will give you and your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall the families of all the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with you. I will keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. I will never leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is, no, uh, this is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. You know, it says Jacob went to a certain place. And in the Old Testament, uh, people believed you know, there were holy places where you could go and meet with God. Two weeks ago, I preached on Rebecca crying out to God, you know, why did you give me these twins? Uh, before she goes and prays, it says, Rebecca went to a place to inquire of the Lord. You know, she went to this place that was a place where she felt the presence of God and, and wanted to pray to him, talk directly to him. So she went to a place. And so here in verse 11, it says, Jacob went, came to a certain place. Now, because of Jesus Christ, we don't have to go to a certain place. God will meet us wherever we want to meet him. We can go directly to the Father. In the Old Testament, God would typically come to his people through visions like we see here or through revelation or through prophecy. But we can go straight to the Lord because of the blood of Jesus. And then we can live in the presence of God. And there is no greater feeling for the believer than walking in the presence of God. This past week, Empty Tomb asked me if I would write a profile about doing grocery deliveries. And they said, just tell us a little bit what it's like, maybe one of your experiences, and and maybe a Bible verse about why, why you like to do this. And so the verse that I quoted was a verse that Uh, We are studying in high school Bible study probably 10 years ago, uh, Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah 58, uh, I believe it's verse 7. Uh, Let's just turn there real quick. Um, Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah 58, beginning of verse 6. It says, is this not the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? And when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own flesh, then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. You know, in that passage, Israel is asking God, why aren't you hearing our prayers? We're fasting, we're crying out to you, we're doing all the right things. How come you still don't hear us? And God answers back, because the real fasting that I'm looking for is feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the imprisoned, loosening the shackles of the prisoners. And so while we were studying this passage, uh, we just kind of as a group decided this is, these were going to be the verses we were going to live out. Uh, we were watching. We also were watching a movie called Live 58. It's on YouTube. It's free if you want to watch it. It's called Live 58. If you ever want, parents, if you ever want to give you and your kids uh, just uh, a appreciation for what you have, uh, watch this documentary called Live 58. And, and it's about living out these verses in Isaiah. And I, I quoted these verses to the folks at Empty Tomb. And as I'm writing them down, I just kept thinking back 
to that time when we were serving for the first time, going out and ministering to the homeless for the first time, handing out food and clothes for the first time, and just thinking, man, it's just so good to walk with the Lord. Like, we don't know where he's going to send us next, who he's going to have us visit next, what conversation we're going to have next. It's all him. It's all him. And so that is the unbelievable feeling of the Christian walking with God. I don't know where he's leading. I don't know what, is the, what the next adventure is. I don't know who he's going to put in my path, but I know that God has brought me to this place, that he is with me and that he will never leave me. You know, God gives Jacob a promise in this verse uh, that we can take for ourselves. This is a 2,000-year-old, 2,000-plus-year-old promise that you can take for yourself. Look with me at verse 15. It says, Behold, I am with you. You know, when we acknowledge that, that God is our Lord and the master of our lives, God says, I am with you. You are not doing this alone. Then he says, I will keep you wherever you go. God says, if I am with you, you are in the palm of my hand and I am in control. That is a promise for Jacob and a promise for us. Then he says, I will bring you back to this land. In other words, I will guide you. You don't need to worry about where you're going next or what tomorrow brings or what next week brings or what the next year brings because I am guiding you. I will bring you back, he tells Jacob. And then he says, I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And for a New Testament believer like ourselves, when God says, I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised, the promise to the believer is, I will not leave you ever, because my promise is fulfilled when you're in heaven with me through the blood of my son, Jesus Christ. I will never leave you. So trust me, walk with me, give your life to me, surrender to me. That's God's promise to Abraham, and it's his promise to us as well. I have to admit, the times in my life where I feel the most confident that I'm walking with the Lord is where I'm out of my own comfort zone. And my wife doesn't know this, but recently I started praying, God, take, me out, take us out of our comfort zone. Make us rely upon you. And I really do believe that things have been happening in our lives where God has answered that prayer. And, and yes, that for a lot of us, that feeling is unsettling when we're out of our routine and we're out of our comfort zone. We're doing things that we're not used to. But I really do feel like God wants us in those situations where we have to rely upon him. Where it's out of our control. There's nothing we can do except pray to him and ask him for the strength, the guidance, the courage, the wisdom, whatever it takes, whatever he needs to supply to help us do the, to help us do the things that he would have us do. And that's where Jacob's at. He's on a 500-mile journey by himself to find a woman he's never met. And so he, he lays down and he just kind of surrenders to the Lord and the Lord comes to him to this, in this vision and gives him this promise. And then look what Jacob says when he, when he stands up and he, wake, he awakes from this vision and he's just heard this promise. He says, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. He's experienced friendship with God, this, this communion with God where God says, I will be your Lord. I will be your God. I will always be with you. I will direct you. I will guide you. I will hold you in my hand. And Jacob wakes up and says, how awesome is this place? Surely this is the house of God. And so for us as believers, yes, that can, act, this can, that can be said about our house of worship where we come into this sanctuary, we hear the word of God, we hear uh, songs of worship and praise, we hear scripture being proclaimed and promised over our lives, and we can say, how awesome is this place? I got to meet God here. How awesome is this place? But that can also be just during the course of your week this week, where you're in, you're in devotion, you're in scripture, you're in prayer, and you start to see God move and work in your life, and you just say to yourself, how awesome is this? How awesome is this that, that God is willing to, to walk alongside me and never leave me and equip me and be my Lord and be my master and be my guy? How awesome is this God? How awesome is this place? 
you know, God is willing to give us those same promises that he gave Jacob over 2,000 years ago. I'll never leave you. I'll always be with you. I'll guide you through this. Just surrender to me. So our final point this morning, it, when we say, how awesome is this place? How awesome is our God? We lift God up in worship. Look with me at verse 18. It says, so early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set up for a pillar and poured oil over the top of it. He named that place Bethel, and the name of the city was Luz or Luz at the first. And then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I go I, and give me bread I will to eat I will and clothing to wear so that I will come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And all that you give me, I will give one full tenth. You know, our worship begins, yes, Sunday morning worship is absolutely the time and the place for worship. But as we leave this place, we are also called to worship the Lord. That we're called to worship him in the way that we live our lives. We're called to worship him in proclaiming the gospel to people. We're called to worship him in humbly serving others. We're called to worship him in the way we interact with our families and we love our families. We are called to worship not just on Sunday mornings, but all the rest of the week, where our lives are, are, are our act of worship. This meeting with God changes Jacob, and we're going to see that now as we go through the story of Jacob, where he's not the schemer or deceiver anymore. You start to see that Jacob is becoming a man of God, and we're going to see that in the weeks to come. His life has been changed. He changes the name of the place where he's at, where he encounters the Lord where it was lose before, that means, I think it's almond tree or walnut tree. Like it meant something, it meant nothing. And he says, no, this place is going to be called Bethel, which is the, the, the house of the Lord. This place isn't going to be known as something typical or ordinary. Something awesome happened here. And so we're, I'm going to call it this other thing. You know, when we start walking with the Lord, when we surrender our lives to him, everything changes from ordinary to extraordinary where all of a sudden it's supernatural because it's all him. Where those, prom those promises from him had nothing to do with us. And so as I close, I just want to look at that verse uh, where Jacob says, uh, if God be with me, uh, verse 20. I want you to look at this verse. It says, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I may come again to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. Now we can read that verse, and we can think that Jacob is saying, well, if God does this, then I'll do this. But that word if, it doesn't, it's not the if that we know, like conditional. Think of the word since. And so look at that verse again, and, and let's, Start it with the word since. Since God will be with me, and since God will keep me in the way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I will come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. Jacob says, God, you're with me. You promise to always be with me. You promise to give me my daily bread and enough to sustain me. You promise to work in my relationship with my family. Then, God, you're, you're my Lord. You're my master. I'll follow, I'll follow you this 500 miles and I'll follow you for the rest of my life. And so that's our prayer this morning. And so as we go to communion, I do want you to think about some of these things. To be thinking about, you know, am I someone that people look at for godly counsel? And what, maybe what spiritual changes in my life do I need to make? Does, have you accepted the love of the father the way Isaac loves Jacob? He doesn't hold his sins against him. God doesn't hold your sins against you. Maybe you need to come to the communion rail this morning and acknowledge that your father loves you no matter what you've done and just leave those sins here at the altar. Maybe you're at a place where you, you know all of these promises, but you haven't truly accepted them. It says you, as you come up to communion or in the silence of your heart after you've had communion, just pray to the Lord. Lord, help me to accept that your promises are true and surrender my life to you. 
Or maybe your worship is worship on Sunday and not the rest of the week. And so you need to come to communion today to take the body and the blood and say to the Lord, Lord, help me to worship you tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. So as you come up for communion today, I just ask that you would just prayerfully in your hearts examine yourselves. This message, every single point for me was like, oh, I need to work on that. I need to work on that. I need to work on that. You know, as you come up for communion, just acknowledge that. You know, Lord, work in my life. I surrender my life to you. Help me to be more like you. Let's pray together. Gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for your word and the promises that it holds. Lord, words that you promised to Jacob thousands of years ago ring so true to us today. And Lord, I confess that there are many times in my life where I'm trying to please people instead of pleasing you. Give me the strength and the courage, just the boldness to stand up and say enough. God is the Lord of my life, and I, and I want to please him for the rest of my life. And Lord, I know I won't do that perfectly, so Lord, forgive me. Lord, thank you for the body and blood of your, of your son. Thank you for your mercy and forgiveness. Thank you for the love of the father that we see uh, Isaac display to his son. You, you display it a million times over. And so, Lord, give us a heart that says, I surrender my life to you, Lord. How awesome is this place. Surely this is the house of the Lord. Amen. So at this time, we'll receive communion. And again, I just want to encourage you as you come up, just examine your hearts and just uh, in a quiet moment, maybe when you've taken, as you're at the rail or as you come back to your seat, just do business with the Lord today. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to each one of them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this also in remembrance of me. So at this time, I'd like to call Ron Suits, our deacon, up uh, to help me serve communion, and Norma as well. And we'll serve communion just among the three of us. And then our ushers will uh, send you up for communion down the sides, and you'll be dismissed up the center. Come, for all things are now ready.
Would you please stand for the benediction? For the benediction, I'd just like to emphasize and reiterate uh, those verses that we read this morning from Genesis chapter 28. After Jacob has had this encounter with the Lord, he's heard his promises. He said that the Lord is his God. He says, surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. I and he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gates of heaven. And so as you go through your week this week, I would just encourage you, just re remember and remind yourself of the awesomeness of our God. We are dismissed.